Silvius Traders Lounge, in partnership with Scope Markets, welcome you to yet another webinar where we learn, trade, and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management, and trading psychology. Today's guest is David England, and our theme is Real Life Application of Trading Knowledge and Skills versus Academic Economic Theories. David England's trading bio. David England has been blessed to have two successful careers, one as an associate professor of finance at John A. Logan College in Carterville, Illinois, the second as a successful trader and investor as and developer of proven trading and investing systems. In academia, David developed financial seminars and 16-week financial entrepreneurship classes, one intro and one advanced, unique to higher education in the United States. His classes began with this is a stock and progressed through trading e-mini futures. With the heart of an educator, David made his progressed, his progress career through, David, sorry, David made his curriculum available to high school teachers. Since 2002, David has taught many how to build financial wealth by teaching the truth about the stock market, then how than the how strategies to make money by success, successful trading and investing. David developed successful systems to give, make money by successful trading and investing. David developed successful systems to give students what he calls HPTs, higher prob probability profitability trades. His trading system is the students what he calls si simple Simon and garden growing in his investing system. David received national attention again in 2015 when he challenged CNBC's main stock picker Jim Cramer to a gentleman's challenge. David gave seven free online lessons on how to use his simple Simon system. In November 2017, David sold the rights to his investing systems. After a two-year sabbatical in January 2020, he started a new stock market educational business, Eye on the Markets Analytics and Training. In July 2020, he will be rolling out a new feature on a weekly blog along with his, his podcast titled The Backstory, where he will be sharing his unique view of the market and trading and investing opportunities. In 2021, his very popular classes will be available online in an English version. Known for his humor and common sense approach, he brings a refreshing blend of academia and successful investing stroke trading experiences to his seminars, classes, columns, and podcasts. So welcome to the launch, David. It's the first time we're having you and we are honored and delighted to have you on board. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So we have, you know, we have people from all around the world watching this, just to kind of give you a general location where I am in the United States. You're very familiar with a city called Chicago. We are yes. less than 300 kilometers south of there. And then the largest city, Sylvia, is a city called St. Louis. And we're less than 200. And you probably heard of the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. Uh, people around the world are, are fans. We're less than 200 miles from St. Louis. So we're right in the heartland of the United States. All right. So maybe you can start off by telling us how you started your trading and investment journey. And what's your daily fuel? I know you, you woke up very early today. And what makes you dive right into the markets? And what type of market instruments do you trade? OK, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of unpacking to do there. In the first part, again, how I started my journey. Very simply, I started my journey because I had too much month at the end of the money. And I didn't want to live like that. So I figured out there's a better way to figure out how money really works. Back in 1972, I had a, uh, a mishap that left me paralyzed and uh, had to learn to walk again. And that, I thank the good Lord for that daily. With, with that, I put a, a, a seed that as I develop a career, I need to make sure that I develop a skill set in case I ever got back in the wheelchair. So whenever you're in a wheelchair, you look at things that are completely different in life. Uh, so with that being said, when they start putting these boxes on our desk called the internet, I said, this is what I've got to find out, how to make money from a financial standpoint. And then they started online, starting where you could do stock trading and investing first and then trading. Of course, in the very beginning, so it was very, very expensive to, the fees were very, very high. 
but I said, I can learn this. So I rolled up my sleeves, learned how the market works. It was very interesting in a small town where I live now, Carterville, back then the population was less than, less than 4,000. Through that box on my desk, now we've got to realize your generation may have grown up with these boxes on your desk. We didn't have these. So it was very, opened up many, many opportunities. But my first stock I ever trade was an Indonesian phone company. And I said, here, if I am in the middle of the United States in a town less than 4,000, and I can build financial wealth for myself, trading a phone company, TOK in Indonesia, I'm always, I've always been a forward thinker. So I'm trying to think what's coming around the corner. So I said, what I've got to do is this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And that's how I got into it. How I got into teaching, first of all, I also, my, my college degree is not in finance. Finance used to bore me. My degree was in marketing and management. And uh, I had a marketing management business here in Southern Illinois. We did a lot of business, got bored with it, started teaching school. As I developed as a trader and an investor, I saw that my students were as ignorant as I was when I was their age about finance. And you talk about ignorant. Matter of fact, Sylvia, it's, I flunked my first finance class. Why? Because it was boring. I couldn't, and, and the instructor worked really hard to make it boring, but I couldn't see how that was going to affect me. Little did I know that down there a few decades later, people around the world would be using my trading systems. But that's the interesting thing called life. So that's how I got into it, started teaching one segment about how to make money in the market in a regular into a business class. It was very popular. That took off after a couple of years, I developed a college level class that became very popular. 2002 hit, I showed people a different system other than buy low and sell high or what they thought it was. And all of a sudden in my, through a lot of hard work, hard work, going early and staying late, I developed very, very in-depth college level systems. And as I, in 2016, when I retired from the uh, community college, I was teaching five of those. That's pretty much all that I taught. So I've been very, so that's how I got into this. Now the, now, the second part of the question was what again, run that by me, please. What kind of asset instruments do you normally trade? Not being coy, the ones that make me the money the quickest with, it depends on, I have three, and what I am is I'm a system designer. I design systems on how people can learn these systems, learn how markets really work instead of how Wall Street wants you to think that they work. So I have systems if you want to be an investor. A system is called growing your garden. If you want to be a swing trader or a momentum trader, that's a simple Simon. Then I also have systems for scalping and actually day trading. What do I trade for the day, for the scalping? I like the futures. It moves fast. That's what I want. The, the other things I focus on high dividend paying funds, either closed in funds or exchange traded funds, not exchange traded notes because there's extra damage or extra risk there. But those are the types of things that I like to invest in and trade to build financial wealth. All right. So I looked into your earlier years of trading and, you know, you're a professor, as you have mentioned. So please talk to us, like assuming this is like a classroom to your students, just explain to us the disconnect between real life application of economic principles, such as demand and supply, inflation and interest rates and the impact those principles have on inve investing and trading from your own trading experience. Okay, there's a lot of different areas, ways I can go in this answer. Let me just say this. One of the reasons why my classes were very popular is because I was taught stock market and trading from a pragmatic aspect, not from theory. Now we study the economic concepts, but by studying those economic concepts, that didn't add a lot of bottom line to my portfolio. So I'm very, very pragmatic in that. Now we have, a, in, our, in the United States, we have a lot of hardworking professors in universities and colleges. As far as the investing that's taught, I was in school in the 1980s and they didn't even begin to teach anything like that when I was at the university. Through the years, they have added more of those types of classes. But one of the reasons why when I left the college and started my own training business, I on the my training, not trading, but training business, I on the market 
which I sold in 2017, it became very popular because people would come to me and say, I didn't get this in college or at the university. Can you teach me how to make money? They said, I can't make money with theory. Now, one of the things I want to, to bring in, we must understand the basics of economic theory. In fact, one of the things that I do is, is, is consult to companies to show them how the economics, especially here in the state of Illinois, affects investing and trading and building financial wealth. But since the market now, the majority of our trading is through analog trading. That means computers versus computers. That puts a whole different play into our strategies. But one thing we can't overlook, the interest rates, the Fed policy, all those things dictate how those computers are going to either buy or they're going to sell. So we need to have a basic understanding. Am I going to have a class, a six week class on studying basic economics? Absolutely not. But I will have online classes and teach people how to use the basics of that to plug into their equations to make their decisions. And when it comes to the analysis, you've got your fundamental analysis and a lot of the economics go into that. And you've got your technical analysis. In the majority, and I study what these analog traders do. And then we'd be on the same side of the trade as they are. At some point in time, if the market would ever go back to the fundamentals, then that's what I would be using. But right now we're far from that. And hopefully that, that adds some, that, that was the answers you're looking or that answered your question. All right, so I'm just curious, based on your response, I'm just curious to know why in 2017 you sold your eye on the market um, business. Can you just tell us the reason as to why you did that? Somebody came to me with a really nice check. <laughs> I, I sold that business, but I have, whenever you own your own business, you are your business. And when you, and people come to you, and I wrote every day, I had followers across the country. And with my last name, I had, I had some followers over in uh, Great Britain, being the last name of England. And when I did the Kramer's Challenge, then I had followers across the country, across the world, as long as it's an English speaking country. And they could understand my Midwestern dialect. But I taught for 26 years. At the same time I taught, I had successful businesses because I wasn't a read out of the book associate professor. I would actually bring real world experience into the classroom. That's what the students liked. So whenever I left the, the college and it was a remarkable run, I, I, was a, I went to school there myself. So it was very much of an honor to be able to go and apply my craft and my trade at the school that I graduated with for our, our local people. But whenever I say local people, I had people drive four hours a night one way to be in my classes and I had people from other states come in. So, and I say that with, with a very humble heart. And why did they do that? Because I, I gave them information they couldn't get elsewhere. So then I start, once I left the college, I started a the eye on the market uh, training business. I built that up and, and I sold it. I've had a two year sabbatical in January. I started, uh, matter of fact, in last September, I started writing my columns again, just to mainly prepare people with what's gonna happen. In 2008, about three weeks in the beginning of September, I warned people it is time to take profits. It's the only time I did that in the media because it's very risky. In September of 2008, early, I told people with the systems that I work and look at, we got a major financial storm sitting right on top of us. And of course, my broker friends got a real, real good kick out of that. Well, three weeks later, they weren't laughing too much or neither were their clients because at that point in time on September the 29th, 2008, three weeks before I gave the people the warning, the Dow dropped 770 points, I think about 13%. We said it doesn't seem like much now with the wild swings we have, but in 2008, that was a huge drop. And so in many times I've been able to give people a heads up and these kinds of things. So why did I sell it? I build things up, I make them better than I found it, I bring value, and I sell them. I like that. Thing, and that same thing I'm doing with this one, uh, the analytics. I'm adding more analytics to this one and more online training that I didn't have before. All right, cool. Um, I like the, the phrase that you say, you bring value and then you sell it. Now, we know that volatility plays a very key role when it comes to trading. 
So maybe you can tell us, you, you can elaborate to us the difference between annualized and actual return, as well as the correlation between volatility in the financial markets and risk management when it comes to protecting the downside, no matter the asset instruments that's being traded. So it can be currencies, it can be stocks, it can be government bonds, it can be European indices and commodities. So, you know, from your professor sort of experience, maybe you can help us understand that a little bit more. I always look at the annualized return. I don't spend a whole lot of time with that because what, what I do and what I teach people to do is watch the return of the markets. And then with my strategies, like the garden growing strategy for investing, I want to see how much more I can outperform the market, not just perform the market. Who wants to do that? As a matter of fact, it's tough to outperform the market. You could buy the main ETF for the S&P 500, SPY, and it will never outperform the market because it has the, the fees in it very, very tough to do. So what I do is I find the securities that are stronger and, and buy those kinds of things. So, and, and I'm not downplaying the annualized return in these kinds of things. What I think is even more important is something, and this will prove a point, Wall Street is so fixated on teaching people how to make money by price appreciation that they miss a huge opportunity. People should actually study the rule of 72 how long it takes for them to double their money, just as much as anything. So let me give you an example. Two ways to make money. Obviously, buy low, sell higher. Well, for a long-term investment, that's, that's very tough because you're going to have, you're, you're going to diversify, but you're going to have many, many price swings in that 20 to 30 years that things are building. In the, about 15-something oh, years ago, I was recuperating from kidney cancer. So it slowed me down. And at that point in time, I had these visions about how can I teach my people to make money if we have a sideways market? So be at that time, the stock market had been flat for 10 years. It didn't average the six to 8% returns a lot of people tout. And yeah, if you go back 50 years, you may do that, but we can't go back 50 years and do our buy. So what I wanted to do is develop something, a system. And what I did is, is I figured out the dividend reinvestment. Let me give you an example. Price appreciation. It's a very, very dangerous strategy because you only have a one in three probability you go make money. And I said, probability. One in three, it's going to go up. One in three, it's going to go sideways. One in three, you're going to go down. I don't want to base my financial livelihood. I want to be a good steward of my money. I read that in one of my favorite books. So I want to make sure that it's going to grow. I'm not burying my talent. So this, let me give you two examples. Somebody buys a, a, a fund they pay $30 for it. They keep it for 10 years. It goes from 30 to 40, down to 15, to 35. 10 years from now, it's at 30. What did they make? Didn't pay a dividend. They've actually lost 10 years of opportunity cost. That's the price appreciation model. Let's compare that to what I call my garden growing strategy, which is the system that I developed for investments. We buy a high dividend paying fund, closed in fund or exchange traded fund. That manager is very, very responsible for what's in that fund. So they, they stay that they have the staff that deals with delegation. So I delegate a lot of research to that fund manager, but we buy that fund at 30 and it pays a spread of 7% dividend. So each month I get a dividend. It's in my Roth. Don't pay taxes on it. What, what it does is, is I start off with hundred shares. My goal is to see how many shares Wall Street can buy for me. So let's say 10 years later, we've had a spread of 7%. Then at that point, my 100 shares is now 200 shares. 10 years later, then I can either continue to have those dividends reinvested or start to take those dividends in cash. So that's what that's what many people overlook, that strategy. Whenever you study Warren Buffett, you take a look at what he says to do, very, very big into dividends. Now they don't pay them, but they like to invest in companies that do. I stay away from companies that have dividends and focus on funds, closed in funds and exchange traded funds. And that's part of one of the products that my analytics sells. Now volatility. I love volatility. I absolutely love volatility. I like to play volatility. I was able to, and I, now this isn't a recommendation, but in February to March, I was able to double a trading portfolio by trading TVIX, 
which we don't even touch that now because it's it's not on it's on the pink sheets. But trading volatility because so the market goes down a whole lot quicker than it goes up. And time is very, very important. I do an analysis of my time. So that's one of the reasons why I like volatility. And right now the VIX is probably trading. I'd have to see what it is today, 29 or 30. That means that the big players see that there's more downside ahead. But I don't look at that number. I, I like to take, and I did a column on this, the volatility. I take a look at other things with the volatility in relationship to moving averages on when I'd be long volatility or short volatility. And what was that third part of the question, Sylvia? Um, I think you answered that question. Uh, okay. Some right. here. Yeah. So I hear that, you know, your approach is basically like a long-term investing model of trading. So maybe you can tell us, because we know governments have a big role to play in the economies. So in this case, given the U.S. economy, you can tell us the role the U.S. government plays when it comes to quantitative easing and how that ties to personal finance goals such as compounding, factoring inflation and interest rates. And, you know, bearing in mind that we're in the coronavirus pandemic, how do you think that affects and, and do you foresee like another financial um, global recession like what happened in 2008? Excellent questions. So let's, let's take a look at the economic policy with the Fed. Since we're talking international, let's also add the central banks throughout the world. Yeah. The amount of liquidity that they either put in the market or take out of the market, put in the market to stimulate it, take out to slow it down, is so important in today's time. In fact, one of the reasons why we have had such a remarkable run since that March bottom, and in fact, the NASDAQ has been up 50 something percent since that March 23 bottom, is the trillions of dollars that the Fed has put into the economy. Now granted, some of that's gonna come back out. But now we're talking trillions. If people haven't ever taken the time to study the jump between billions and trillions, they need to, because it's an ex it's, it's, it's not the same size as between thousands and millions and millions and billions. It's an exponential jump. So three trillion is a heck of a lot of money in relationship to the trillions that the, that the central bank outside the United States has put in. They pretty print it let's put in a floor to keep us from going in and testing that bottom with what we know now. So now there's a lot, of, a lot of parts to unpack in this question. The interest rates, so important. The cost of money, so important on the company's earnings. The monetary policy back years ago, I used to tell people, the government's buying our securities and every time that it, you know, we're, we're talking about in the eighties and early nineties. And I would say they're doing that in, in a lot of broker friends that I have. And well, I've got a lot of friends that are brokers, the hardworking folks, hardworking folks. So I'm not doubting anybody. We don't make ourselves taller by making others shorter. And by the way, being a brokerage system is probably one of the hardest jobs anybody will ever have, especially those are folks that have the good heart and want to do the best for the markets. But, I was telling people, whenever prices go down and test for support, the market's coming in and buying. The government is. I said, probably to the Treasury Department. Well, 10 years later, they made it, they said it was true that during the Reagan administration, they have what's, what's established called a plunge protection team. Plunge protection team. Now, now, they can't keep the markets up forever, but they can keep it good. They, they can help it. So, uh, plunge protection team, and it's commonplace now. They don't hide it. The Fed has bought many, many bond funds. You can go in and take a look at those and see the price of those after it goes up. So monetary policy, so important. Take a look at a couple of Decembers ago, 2018. It was a nice time to short when they started to raise the rates. And by the way, I don't have a whole lot of confidence that the Fed's always going to th do things that are right. I can remember before the real estate difugality, uh, Chairman Bernanke says he didn't see that there's going to be any major problems in real estate that would cause a problem. Well, he was wrong. By the way, they're human. They make air just like we do. So that's why it's so important for you and me, anybody watching it, to roll up their sleeve to learn how it really works. Don't be reliant on what somebody else says is going to happen. Let's learn the truth so we can make our better decisions now. 
So with that being said, volatility, I love it. I'm waiting to play it again. I am hesitant about going long stocks or funds from here outside of out swing and momentum trading as long as the volatility is where it is today. But people should not fear volatility. For those of us who know how to work it, it can be many, many opportunities to play volatility. And what was the third part of that question, please? Um, how does that tie uh, individually now to ourselves as traders? What, when, the, when the government regulates uh, QE, how does that tie to sound personal finance goals for individual traders? Let's, let's explain it this way. I watch what the Fed does on a weekly basis. I was looking back November and December, seeing the liquidity, even though the Fed says, no, we're in good shape. Market's making new high, new highs. They were putting a lot of money into the economy. They were doing unofficial quantitative easing, although they said we aren't doing quantitative easing. We could see it on the screen. So that's whenever the, the I, I do coaching for people that are investors. I don't tell them what to buy or sell, but I coach them on how to have higher HPTs, higher probability trades or higher profitability trades and then to dissect how the market really works. But in my, in my audits where I help people audit their account to see how they are really performing versus just being in the market, I was saying, danger, danger. We've got something that's coming here. And that's whenever I started doing, just sticking my toe in the water incrementally with uh, volatility. And then when, it, when the market dropped, my volatility stuff just took off like a rocket ship. I didn't touch my long-term holdings because as long as they don't drop their dividend, it's really a gift because the lower the price, when that dividend comes in, it's buying me more shares. So my share accumulation trend is a lot higher. So, but what I do is, is I trade to hedge against my long-term garden growing. And then I also trade, I enjoy trading, but I don't trade every day. But those are just some of the things, as long as volatility is up, as long as interest rates are low, low interest rates are like fuel to the fire to keep the, the markets up. The, uh, amount, the large amounts of money by the Fed, the central bank, that's fuel to the fire. But now, so we've got to be careful because what the Fed giveth, at some point in time, the Fed will give it, take it back. And whenever they do, I definitely will be playing even a lot more volatility when that happens. And let me just say something about, you've got a lot of traders that are watching this around the world. I personally don't trade. You know, like you said in your, in your monologue there, I've, had, I've been very, very blessed to have two careers. One in the real world of business, the other one in the world of academia. It's given me an interesting sight on how things really work. But one of the biggest things that people do is, is they overtrade. Here's an idea. Take Monday off. Why would you do that? Well, Sunday's a lot more fun if you don't have to go to work on Monday. But let the market dictate support and resistance for you. And then focus on trading. Now focus on trading Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and maybe the open Friday. I've learned through trial and error, your time off is just as important as your time on. If you're wore out, you don't take a day of rest, which is so important. We don't take a day, day of rest on the weekend. You see how dragging we are at uh, Thursday or Friday. Can't be sharp. And the only way we can really be successful is to be able to focus. So let the market dictate support and resistance. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, if it breaks out above that resistance, you're long. If it breaks down underneath support, you're short but spend less time trading, but when you are trading, be able to focus like a laser beam. All right, I like that. Now, maybe you can tell us how you go through your typical, because um, you build systems basically, like during your presentation, maybe you can give us uh, some insights into your simple Simon system. Okay. And then, and then after your presentation, we will take questions from the participants. 
I can see we have about 39 guys in the session. Well, good. All right. And I appreciate everybody that's, appreciate everybody that's watching today. How I start my day, as far as my day, it depends on if I'm trading or not. Uh, before the trading day or the week starts, I like to follow seven markets. The indexes, the major indexes, uh, semis move the market, energy, real estate, and global. And whenever I, whenever I trade, and I'm not trading the futures, whenever I swing trade or momentum trade, I have my overbought levels already there and my oversold levels already there. So whenever I wake up, one of the first things I do after I make my coffee, my coffee, very, very important to us traders. And uh, then I do my Bible study. That's a must. That sets my foundation and my meditation, my prayer time for the day. It gets me back into my inner circle. But what's really important. And then very simply, I'll have alerts that if any of these seven groups fit into what I'm looking at with my system, then it lets me know. Sylvia, I've wasted so much time in front of these screens, so much time, because I didn't use the tools in front of me with alerts. And in the United States, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, saying, chasing rabbits down holes. I know you have rabbits in Kenya, and they make holes. But what that means is, is we go from st hot stock to hot stock to hot stock to hot stock, or business deal, business deal, business deal, and we never become really, really successful in one. We pull up stakes and we go to others. So my, my suggestion is, is some of the most successful traders that I've taught, they trade one thing and they know it like the back of their hand. And whenever they focus on that one thing, <clears throat> they see what the institutions do when it gets to a certain price level or a certain indicator level. And they can be very, very successful because they focus like a laser beam. So whenever I start my day, I'll be watching the, the markets. I'll be seeing what's going on. And if I only swing trade or momentum trade whenever it hits my alerts. And so let me go ahead and just dissect with a simple Simon. Yeah. One of the biggest problems that traders make is they make it too, make it too uh, in depth and make it difficult. Let's keep it simple. I, I studied hundreds of chart setups, because I'm a system designer, and I'm, a I'm big into technical analysis. I studied setup after hundreds and hundreds of setups to find out what didn't work. And what I wanted to do is to have a system that I could set the alerts and only trade when my system hit. And with that system, it's very simple. Trend line, moving average, exponential moving average of 30. Then I look for momentum. My previous simple assignments are shaking money flow. Mark Chaykin did an excellent job on developing that. So I have a momentum and then whenever my price gets above my trend line, that's kind of hard to do a scan for trend line, but you can do it. My price closes above the 30 period moving average on a daily chart. I need to have three increasing bars on momentum but then I must confirm that a lot of times with the slow indicator, the MACD. Once it gets to those indicators, by the way, no system is 100%, but what I wanna do is a higher probability system. And that's why I gave away my system free uh, to anybody that responded to the Kramer challenge years ago. But once those things alerts are hit, then that's when I trade to do my swing trading and momentum trading. If the, I don't force a trade, I only trade when those indicators hit because those indicators are the ones that signal the institutional buys. If the institutions are not coming in, I don't want in because it's not gonna go up. If the institutions aren't shorting it, <clears throat> I don't wanna short it. And by the way, I love to short, but I must say this, and I wrote a column about this last month, shorting is a high risk trade because it has the potential of losing all in your account plus some. <clears throat> what I like to do is to go long the leveraged bear funds because that gets into my managed risk. There's an exact amount I can lose. Of course, I wouldn't let that go down, but always, you know, never limit your upside. 
always limit your downside with risk management. So that's the simple Simon. I watched that and the simple Simon is designed for swing trades and momentum trades. Just this last week, I got some good signals. I've been waiting to short the market or go along my leverage volatility for some swing trades or momentum trades. And just this last week, uh, I got the signals and picked up uh, some of the triple NASDAQ, even though that's the strongest, but after 50% run, they're going to be taking profits on that. I want to be a part of that. And then also I picked up some leveraged S and P 500 bear funds. So hopefully that, that, that will help. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we can, you can be in a position to illustrate to us through a chat, you know, the simple Simon system. No, I'm sorry. I can't do that because of my backup system and I don't want to do anything to, uh, to, to, to my zoom on it, but, but I'm, we're having some computer difficulties in Southern Nord day and I'm not going to be able to get that. But once again, once this is broadcast on the YouTube, the next day or two, I'll be happy to send those to you. And then you can add to the presentation. And I apologize right. for the computer difficulties. All right, cool. So I think my colleague will join me now in helping to answer the questions from our participants. If you have sure. nothing else to add between now and yeah. So Dennis. Okay, so one of the guys is asking whether you're adding gold to your portfolio. Okay, when am I adding gold to the portfolio? Yep. I don't. I prefer, currently I prefer silver over gold. And one of the reasons why the pressure, precious metals, precious metals don't pay a dividend. If I'm going to hold something over a period of time as a hedge, I'm going to get a dividend out of it. But right now I prefer silver, physical silver over gold. Uh, if you want to trade that SLV, and there's also some leveraged silvers that you can also trade. Now I think, but another reason is, is I've always been a fan of silver. Silver is the poor man's gold. I like simply the silver rounds because they could also be used for barter. If we get into dire straits again and something would happen electronically to our computers or these kinds of things, kind of like what's happening to my computer today, then I've got something of value there that I can barter. And that's so important to me. Now I'm not against gold. It's just that I get a better return on other things besides gold. Okay. Excellent question. Keep them coming. All right. Um, maybe you can give us more insights into the simple um, Simon system again, as we wait for guys yes. to ask more questions. Yes. Yeah. Here's a simple Simon. Trend lines. Always have your trend lines. If the price continues to go down, have the trend line to see the breakout. Because what I'm looking for is what I call the institutional action zone. Where and what are the indicators that the institutions are looking at to come into a trade? So there's three key points. Trend line breaks. If I'm going to go long, I've got to break above that trend line. Am I going to go short? I got to break below the trend line. The second thing is, is, you know, for years, we've been told that the 50 period moving average is what the institutions need before they come in. Well, that's just not true. Many times it's the 20 moving average of the exponential. I like to have the 30 because it keeps me from getting whipsawed. So point one, a trend line, draw your trend line. Number two, 30 moving average on a daily chart. And I like the exponential. The third thing, check in money flow, the CMF, and then have that confirmed with, we always have to have confirmation. I like the good old MACD, moving average convergence divergence. If I don't get a confirmation with all four of those, I don't go long. And the, my, my friends that have multiple indicators, you don't make money with indicators. You make money with what the indicators tell you. So yes, I'm in the big into technical analysis, but I don't do it for a hobby. I've got some friends that have nine screens. Okay. When they added, when they went from eight screens to nine screens, did they make more money? No, because they're too busy trying to see the bells and whistles on the charts. Keep it simple. <clears throat> when we keep it simple and we control our emotions, 
we'll see a darker green on our screen. So important. Um, there is a question by one Ian. He's asking if your system has ever failed you and how did you deal with it? What, okay, I just want to make sure, did my system ever fail me? Was that the question? Yes, yes. Okay, if we ever have somebody that says their system is 100%, they are either not being true or they're deranged. Very simple, they're just trying to sell systems. No system is 100%. All I wanted to have something was more of a 70% probability. So have I ever had, yeah, there's been many, there's been times that I've gotten the buy signal on a swing trade or momentum trade. And then the next day we've got some very, very negative news and it goes against me. That's why my protective stops got me out. Protective stops are so much, so important. You can't, you can't trade without protective stops. People say, well, I don't wanna lose two, 10%. Well, look at the 90% you're gonna save. So yes, there's been times when, you know, I can't forecast the, the future news. I don't have a crystal ball. Maybe you guys have some of those in Kenya, but and I rather doubt it. But nothing is 100%. That's why you always have a backup plan in case it goes against you. Risk management, proper risk management has saved more traders than anything. Okay? Okay. Um, one of the guys is asking, given the current uh, tensions between the United States and China, do you think the dollar hegemony is... Is, is being threatened, do you think it's going to last as it has been since the Second World War? I think that, well, first of all, we've been in economic war. We as the United States and other countries have been in economic war with China for a number of years. Keep in mind, China is a communist country with many, many capitalistic aspects. Unfortunately, when we go to our local stores, many of the products that, and this is so sad, are from China. But the reason that is, is because that's what the consumer wants to be able to save money. What we need to have is more American-made products in our, in our United States market. And in Kenya, you need to have more Kenyan products that will stimulate more jobs. I believe we're only in about inning two or three with this war with China. Now, China's got their hands full with what's going on in India. You know, India's population continues to go up. India is a democracy. I see many, many, many good plays in India. And that gets back to a question I didn't answer about the global economy, and I will get that in just a moment. So we are having more and more. The, the agreements that we had with China, especially with the agriculture, was set so high, I don't see those as being being able to be met. And from the United States standpoint, China is not our friend. We need to realize that. In the United States, a large number of our pharmaceuticals come from China. That's just nothing but wrong and many other products. But that gives us an opportunity. Now, speaking of the Chinese market this last week, the Chinese market has uh, pretty much exploded. But it's still lagging from the numbers that we saw come in from March. Now, a couple of other questions, let me say this. You, one thing I didn't get to a while ago, so he's asked me about, do we see a global recession coming? My mm -hmm. answer to that is yes. As a chartist, I, looked at, I, I, I take a look at the top seven or eight global economies. If you want, I can send that chart also. But there's only been two economies that have outperformed the, the United States market since the March 24 low. The rest of the economies have underperformed it. So if we should have another black swan event, then I don't care what the Fed does, we'll come back and test those previous lows. Now, some people that study Elliott waves are already saying a grand super cycle is already starting down. Now, is that true? Well, what we need or what they need to make their story true is to have a, another black swan event that caused panic selling. But one thing I talked about earlier, the NASDAQ is up over 50% from the March lows, continues to go up. But at some point in time, the institutions are gonna take their profits and we'll have a good 10 to 15% pullback. That's when I'll be trading volatility and I'll be looking to see where I want to lock in profits 
from my leveraged bear funds that I buy. So yes, I see, and, and, and I pray that this COVID, remember that's COVID-19, what we've got really got to be concerned with is are the facts and the mutation of COVID-19 into other formats. Now, in the United States, they say we're still in wave one, okay, whatever they want to say. Our lives have changed dramatically. I'm sure that people in Kenya's lives have changed also. Yeah. But we're just in like the early, early phases of this COVID because we're going to be moving into the cooler months here in just a few months. Our school children are going to be going back to school. We're going to have more interactive interaction. Uh, the six foot rule and masks. Uh, many people say that's not, they aren't going to do that. That's their decision. But COVID is here. And what we're finding, Sylvia, is we're really starting to see the negative effects of not being able to go out. I think it's very smart that we don't but that's going to affect. We have many, many restaurants and bars in the United States that will never open again. When I drive down the street and I see small businesses, it's dark in there. Many small businesses are never going to open again. And my heart goes out to those business owners that have had risk and all those employees that used to make their money there. So we're just in about ending three of this mess. And yes, I, and I pray that, that this COVID doesn't mutate into something that's going to be even more dangerous. But whenever you study these pandemics, mutation is, you know, to me, I think it's already mutated, but I'm not a scientist. Don't play one on TV. I just take a look at the market. But yes, we have a whole lot more risk ahead of us. And let's just hope that uh, a black swan event doesn't happen. But we are going to be seeing the fiscal effects of COVID and for those states in the United States that were already fiscally, F-I-S-C-A-L-Y, damage, it's only going to be more dangerous with their gross, their GDP per state dropping. And the number of people that are unemployed that jumped a couple of weeks ago as far as going back to work, we've got to see those numbers increase. But it's that, as far as our governments go, it's such it's so difficult decision because we've got to have commerce going on. But our people also need to be protected. So that's why I definitely pray for our leaders daily. All right, David, what can you tell people who have a long term perspective to trading in this pandemic period? Like, what would be your advice to, to them? You know, with people who are playing like the five year, 10 year plan, sort of equities, investing, something like that. First of all, there's more opportunities in trading than ever before. I alluded to this earlier. When I started out, I got excited whenever in the 80s, I had an E-Trade account and they dropped the commission to $39 a trade. That kind of dates me about how far I go back. Oh, I started in 87. I had a good four months until the bottom fell out in 87. So, so that's how long I've been involved in studying and watching the market and actually participating with skin in the game, so to speak, with money in it. But as far as advice to traders, trade less. When they ask me what indicators are the best, there's no such thing as a good indicator or a bad indicator. What we're taking a look at is put on your detective cap. See what indicators the institutions are using. And here's, here's an exercise. Here's the professor, associate professor coming out, Sylvia. Yeah. Pull up a daily chart of the last week or two and start putting in your favorite indicators. And then when the price of a security bottoms, draw a vertical line. When that security has topped, draw a vertical line. And then go down and look at your indicators, which indicators gave the best signals. Once again, we're detective. I want to see which indicators the algo traders are using. And that's then I want to be on the other side. So no, once again, no such thing as a good indicator or bad. There's indicators that they're using more and then with those indicators, we must also take a look at which settings they use. Whenever I trade futures, I really, really have fast settings. Whenever I'm investing, I have very uh, settings as far as like the check and money flow may go from five to 20. The RSI, don't just 
keep 14. It reminded me of one of my mentors, Dr. Alexander Elder. And whenever I was developing the classes at the college, I had somebody got his name about, I've never met a stranger. So just out of the blue, I sent him an email, asked him a question within 24 hours. First thing he says, I apologize for the delay. Here's your answer. And I didn't take advantage of that, but whenever I got into a roadblock, I would send him the question, he'd give me the answer. But one of the, in one of his many studies, and he's still very active today, Dr. Alexander Elder, and I recommend one of his books. He says the, the big money doesn't use the same indicator settings in bull markets as they do bear markets. So don't just set your sights just because they may use an indicator in a certain setting going up, they are very competitive. They're going to use a different indicator. So don't be lazy on these indicators. Look at those settings. One of the biggest mistakes people do is on the RSI, they continue 14. That's a default. Sylvia, I don't want to look at the same indicators everybody else is. I want to tweak those to see which ones the big money, once again, is keying off of. Another advice to traders, trade less and don't over trade because it, take, no more, it takes up your capital, takes up your energy, because really the work just begins once you start to buy. Buy incrementally, scale in, scale out. And when you start to scale in or buy incrementally, let's just, and I'll give you an example. Let's say on my trades in one particular portfolio, let's say that 5% is the max I'm going to allocate. And let's say that equates to 50 shares of a security. Well, I set the alerts. If my simple assignment gives me a buy signal, I may start off with 25 shares and I set my stops. If it continues to go up and the institutions come in, then I would only add my other 25 shares. So don't just be either all in or all out. Scale in, scale out. And once it hits your profit, then lock in some of those profits. Trading is not a hobby for me. Trading is a business. And I look at stock as inventory. I look at every dollar in that account, especially my Roths, the little soldiers that I've got to be put, I've put to work to make sure that they get the best return for me. So trade less, study a little bit more, and then get away from the screen because your time off is just as important as your time on. And learn to focus like a laser beam. All right. Um, one of the people in the room is asking, what is, according to you, what is the most important skill in trading? And as you answer that question, you, said that in your simple Simon system, you use the exponential moving average. So maybe to those who are new to trading, you can explain the difference between exponential and simple moving averages before we wind up. Okay. I like the exponential because with simple, on the, let's just use the 30. Each of those 30 days have equal weight. So that's a simple moving average exponentially it's weighted more towards real time. So the closing price or the price on the 30, 29, 28, 27, 25 has a higher weighting than 30 days ago. So I'm finding more and more of the institutions are gonna be using the exponential. So hopefully that helps. But once again, go in and study, plug in the numbers. I use stockcharts.com. I think that's one of the best charting software Chip Anderson and his people have worked together on that for, for years. Invest a little bit in a good charting software. A lot of times, uh, you know, it may cost $25 a month, $30 a month. It's well worth it if you get your return on investment. Okay, that was the last part. And Sylvia, what was that other part of the question? I, I just wanna make sure I'm right on, please. Yeah, one curious guy in the room is asking, according to you, what is the most important skill in trading? Uh, getting rid of your emotions. Only making decisions on what your system says. No, don't trade what you think is going to happen. Trade what you see happening. Now, Sylvia, emotions are very, you know, there's a lot of decisions we make emotionally. Making money and investing or trading, that's not in that group. 
many times and whenever I help students audit their accounts, their biggest, they, they were able to make money, but they weren't able to control the downside. And that's what blew out accounts. Another, th another situation is, is they haven't taken the time to, to have an effective system. They just bought, unfortunately, what they see on TV or what some talking head had to say. And by the way, let me just say on the Kramer challenge, it's where I publicly challenged Jimmy Kramer, the stock guru on CNBC on, he came out years ago with his 49 stocks to buy. He demanded for people to buy them right now. Well, if he had to sit here's 49 stocks to watch, I have no trouble with this, but I had more and more people in my office buying on what they saw some so-called guru on TV talk about. And whenever they were buying, they should have been selling. So that's whenever I challenged Mr. Kramer, the gentleman's challenge. And I ran his 49 picks through my simple Simon and saw they were garbage picks at the time. The bottom line is, is after one year, only 13 of his 49 buy right now picks were making money. But that also gave me, during the time when I had that business, I gave away my simple Simon for free and seven step online investing program, which that's no longer available. But uh, once again, I'll give my simple assignment to the people on this. You, you'll receive that next day or two. But the biggest thing is, is take emotions out of trading. Focus on trading and investing like a business. And that's where it should be. And then also, trading can be, let's talk about the dark side, Sylvia, mm -hmm. of trading. It's just like if you have a 16-year-old child and you know they can't go buy a, they're in their identity period. They can't go by the mirror without checking their hair or whatever. It, 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 it's interesting. Uh, but if we <clears throat> can't put our phone down, or if we can't go by our computer without turning it on to see our stocks are, we've got a problem. And that means that dopamine rush, it's like whenever we get a text or a Facebook message or whatever, a little dopamine pop. The same thing with trading. We should have a Traders Anonymous, just like we have an Alcoholic Anonymous, Alcohol AA. And, and I'm not being coy. I'm, I've seen so many people get involved with trading and it ruined, they're, they're, after, they're feeling the jazz and that's what ruins their life. That's the only thing that's important. As a trader, I like to do it. I like to invest more and then trade to build income for that. But make sure that, that trading does not run your life because it can ruin your life. There was time, and, I, and I'm speaking firsthand. Years ago, I got involved with it, that that was pretty much uh, what was important. Well, that didn't work out too well. So let's use it as a tool. And it's a very good tool. It's one of the quickest ways to build economic, financial wealth. Now, personally, as far as wealth goes, if you're surrounded by love, have good health, and have a strong faith, you're, man, it had nothing to do with money. You're a very, very wealthy person. Our conversation here deals with financial wealth. And what my, my, what my slogan is, is plan your work, work your plan, and most important, share your harvest. And I'm big about sharing, just like we're doing today. Okay? All right. Thank you, David, for that. Uh, we pressed for time, um, but maybe you can tell us where people can go to find your work, your analysis, the simple Simon system, which uh, podcasts, basically the links to your work. And then also in line with what you were saying about watching news, what was the lesson that traders drew from you? Jim Cramer's challenge when it comes to watching uh, market-related news and investing stock trading. Okay, let's start off with that last one first. What's the biggest thing about the Cramer challenges? Just because some so-called guru says it's time to buy or sell, do your homework. Put turn those buy or sell recommendations into a watch list. Watch them for a while. In fact, there will be buy recommendations that will be on today and Monday. Watch the, what we, the people just go in and buy. Well, after that momentum goes up, they may be excellent short candidates. 
So, and also if, if we were watching one of the major networks and one of the paid hacks, I mean, one of the people come in and they say, it's time to buy this or that. You'll see that, that, that will trigger analog trading programs because some of these programs are triggered by words that either our leaders have to say or the Fed or a president or some of the key leaders in the, in the world, if they say some things negative, then that will stimulate, I mean, within seconds, cell programs to hit. So as far as the Kramer challenge, treat them as a watch list and plug them into your system to see if you're really getting buy signals or sell signals. So the key system is so important. And by the way, as far as Mr. Kramer, this was no nothing personal against Mr. Kramer. I challenge anybody to find out, to, to know somebody that knows more about individual stocks than Mr. Kramer. But knowing about a company and knowing when it's time to buy and sell are two different things. And by the way, he, he has a list out now about the, the COVID-19. A lot of hard work went into that list, and I see some really good opportunities there. So I don't want to think that I'm downing him. I'm just talking about people need to empower themselves. Now, where do people find out about me? Uh, sometime in July or August, my website will be up. But until then, the, uh, just go to my Facebook page, David England Facebook. Any of my columns are posted there. Once this gets into YouTube, it will be posted there. Uh, my interviews are posted there, and that's the best place. And, and whenever the website rolls out, the instructions on that will be posted there also. All right, David. Um, you will send me your chats, and then I will plug them in in the, in the upload, as you have indicated. And thank you for giving us your trading insights today. We'd love to have you again in the future. We continue asking people to open live trading accounts with Scope Markets. Uh, you need a trading platform to trade. That's the first step. So thank you so much for your time. We're grateful and it's a wrap. Have a good day. Well, thank you for the opportunity. God bless. Yeah. Thanks guys for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.